welcome to the Guts to Fail episode two. Um, I'm so glad that you're here in Bungalow U, and we are going to um, be talking to a very special guest today. He's my new friend, Patrick Ganino. Um, he like his friends call him Patty G, and he is just an interesting guy that I am so excited that I have gotten to know. He um, is in town in the rail district painting a giant mural of, you'll just have to see it. I'll post some pictures later, but um, he's a, he's a really, really well-known muralist and he's been on shows like Extreme Makeover Home Edition, Hell's Kitchen, uh, Tabitha's yeah. Salon Takeover, Makeover, yeah. something like that. And he's just, he's amazing. But from that, he has developed a, back in 2008, I believe, right? 2008? Yep. Uh, social Tuna, which is his social media marketing company. And I'm going to let you uh, tell them about how that all went. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to welcome Patrick and let him tell us a little bit about his story and his background so that you all can uh, uh, hear it from him. And we have several people hopping on right now. Awesome. Well, Brookie Lynn, it's been a pleasure to get to know you. I'm a New Englander from Connecticut, New York area. And I got to tell you, Texas has some of the nicest people in the world. I was literally walking this morning to get a little breakfast burrito. I was talking to my best friend on the phone, Jim. And I was like, like, would you ever live there? I was like, I don't know, man. It's real hot. But I said, these are the nicest people I've met in the whole country. And I've been all over the country, West Coast, East Coast, Colorado, you name it. And uh, really, really pleasant to be here. So I love it. Yes, we're glad to have you. Everybody in Texas is great. Everybody. Yeah. Well, you. yeah, you know, you might stay here long enough and find a couple of ones that aren't so bad. But not I like so that everybody wants me to go shooting with them. Everybody's like, you want to go shooting? <laughs> really do How like did you that. like that when you did do it? I liked it. I, I liked heard it you were pretty good. You were a good shot. <laughs> I'm something. Yeah, you were. Everybody was saying it, Sal especially. Okay, so tell me about... Tell me about how what, you got evolution? into yes the evolution how you got into murals and where that come comes from where how did that start? Well, I mean, I always drew as a kid. I was a doodler. You know, I wasn't. Uh, I was always a social guy. I wasn't really that into school, but I doodled a lot. And I did okay, you know, until high school, and then the social activities got bigger, and my interest in school got a little smaller. Um, <laughs> so it happens. So. Uh, my best friend was going down to school in Florida, and my family wanted me to go to Florida, uh, wanted me to go to school, so I was like, why not Florida? So I went down to Florida, went to school for about two weeks, and I dropped out. So at that time, he was working at a nightclub, and they needed a reggae mural done. It was like Thursday night reggae night. So um, they were like, we'll give you $500. And, you know, I was an 18, 19-year-old kid, and I was like, $500? Okay, I'll do it. So I did it. I probably spent $400 on supplies and learned a little lesson in business right there at that age. After that, I started valet parking at restaurants to make money. And I started my own little valet company for a short period at this restaurant called INJ Station House down in South Florida. And I pitched him on doing a mural on the side of his building. And he went for it. And I think I charged like $2,000 at that time. Um, so I did that. <laughs> yeah, when it was, it was a big, sort of a bigger mural. So I did another nightclub. I putzed around in Florida for a little bit. I was still a kid, still having fun and, and doing my thing. And then I came back to Connecticut and got a job. Worked for about a year in um, doing contracts for a company called Icon. I was in a little cubicle, so I was doing dispatch first and then went up to contracts. And it was just not for me. I mean, it was a great life, you know, being in that cubicle, doing the same thing every day. And um, so it was, it was when I was getting married, um, we were looking at a restaurant and uh, they wanted a mural done. So I did it. And I don't remember what that one cost. But at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm doing it. So I just quit my job and I started hitting the pavement and I started walking up and down the street, going into restaurants. We, we named the commercial, you know, business. I walked in and I just started pitching myself. I got a mural here, a mural there. And, and this is 20 years ago. So I opened up the Yellow Pages phone book. Didn't have cell phones mm -hmm. like <laughs> and I called contractors and builders and architects. And I just started talking to them. I just did my thing and it started creating relationships. And I built it up from sort of lower mid-class homes to mid-class homes to upper mid to high end. And eventually got to the point where we were working in, you know, you know, 10, $20 million homes in Greenwich, which is right over the border of New York. It's a very wealthy town in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. 
And and that was great. And I did that for a, a good chunk of time. And it was, I think it was like 2009, we started kind of having a little bit of a recession. Um, and I knew at that point my back had started hurting me. Because when you do murals, you're climbing ladders, you're on scaffold, you're you know contorting your body. And it was taking its toll on me. So I was like, I got to come up with a product I can sell. I want something that can make money without having me to have to be there. So um, I came up with this product line. It was a plaster line and glaze line. I private labeled it. Went to Canada, met with the, you know the company. And at the same token, or at the same time, I came out with these DVs: how to paint trees and how to paint clouds. And I started filming artists from all over the country, from France, Italy, Maryland, you name it. And the thought process was to leverage off other people's you know, uh, fan base. So everybody has their own group of people. So if you meet one person, you have the ability to get in front of a hundred people. So if you meet two people, 200 people, so on and so forth. So by making them the stars of it, they're promoting my product. Right. So if that one person has a hundred people and they look at their video, well, they may go look at the other guy's video too. And the other guy's video, and it worked pretty well for a little period of time. Mm-hmm. At the same moment, my plaster and glaze line was falling apart because it was winter in Connecticut and we were shipping it and the cans were expanding and blowing up in the truck. Now insurance would come with a cost, but it didn't really help the fact that it was not working so well. So my cost on the product line was high and my profit was low and my cost on the DVDs was low and the profit was high. Mm-hmm. So to expand even further, I, um, I'd been on a couple of forums for decorative painters and I decided to start my own called fullform.com. And the whole idea was to create a safe place for decorative artists, muralists, to go and communicate with each other and learn from each other and then passive sell them my DVDs with a little ad on the right side. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing took off. It really did well for a small market. Um, And we had a good amount of decorative painters and artists from all over the world down there, mainly in America, but we had, you know, Australia, you know, great artists like Ron Francis, Pascal and Blard, Sean Crosby, Pierre Finkelstein, you name it. And um, we ended up getting a phone call from Sherwin Williams. So Sherwin Williams called and I'm like, okay, so like, listen, we're coming out with a product line called uh, Foam Impressions, the glaze line. Mm-hmm. And you obviously have the eyes and the ears of the industry we're trying to sell it to. We want you to come up to Cleveland. So they flew me up to Cleveland. I talked to them a couple of times. They decided they want to put an ad on my website for $1,000 a month. So all I had to do was put a little ad on the top of my website, and I'm making $1,000 a month. So I did, it, I did that for a while with them, kept on the forum. But I realized relatively quickly that – the art world in general, there's a cap as far as how much money I can make. There's a ceiling on it. Mm-hmm. Um, the DVDs were doing fine, but also at the same time, MySpace was going by the wayside. Facebook was coming out, and YouTube had really blown up on the scene. So a lot of this information that I was trying to sell, you can now get free online. So I had to pivot. That's um, one of my words. That is one of my words. I'm that's so why I use the Brookie Lynn. Brookie Lynn. It's so, like um, you saw my pad. <laughs> yeah, I felt it. I felt it. So um, there was an industry organization called Idali, used to be called Valley, it's for decorative painters. They contacted me at the same time. Uh, all this was going on. They were like, listen, we have a physical magazine and we're bleeding. Can you help turn it digital? Because I'd done well with full form and they thought I was sort of a little bit of a whiz when it came to the internet, which I'm not. I just hire people that are. And um, okay. we, focus on that for a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of people that are watching this and will be watching it later struggle with trying to be good at everything instead of finding people that are good at what you're not and focusing on what you just love to do. And can you just for a second talk about that a little bit more and how important that is to your business? I can. I'm good at two things, maybe four. We'll talk about the two I can talk about online. (laughs) One of them is mural. I'm a good mural artist. I'm fast. I'm efficient, right? Uh-huh. Number two, I'm a great networker. I'm good at networking with people and meeting people. I naturally enjoy meeting people. My father was a very social individual. He's a commercial salesman, and people love my father. But it's because he genuinely liked that. He liked to hear about people's lives and what they're doing. I remember when I was a little kid, we went into a little gas station in a convenience store, and um, he starts talking to the clerk. who's like, this is my son Patrick's introduced me to the guy, and they're having this whole conversation. Not many people do that. And he was like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm like that very much. So is my son, Carter. He's a very social guy. He just likes people. Mm-hmm. So to yeah. me, networking was huge because it, it branched out my ability to meet people in different fields, learn things, um, upgrade the level of clientele, friendships, you know, you name it. It's all good things coming from the network. Um, mm-hmm. As far as everything else goes, I delegate. I delegate 90% of things I do. I find people that are, are efficient, they're smart, they're loyal, 
and I delegate out to them. I'm that 20,000 foot high guy that has the crazy ideas and then I pass them along. Uh, because there's only yeah. one person, only one person they were doing. That's that's also why I started the social media marketing uh, company was because again with murals, I have to be there to do it. So if I don't work, I get paid. So I wanted to see if I could take my knowledge on building this mural company, which evolved, which I'll get into, into another business which would have no roof and allow me to have you know employees to build it and make me money while I'm doing something else. Right. And, and it, it started basically with Sherwin Williams. Then with iDAO, turning that into a digital format, Facebook was coming out, blogs were becoming huge at that point, and I started pitching my high-end interior designers. First one was probably one of the spectacular designers out there, Amy Hirsch out of Greenwich. And um, we turned her platform digital, and, and that evolved over time as well. I mean, you know, blogs became a little less important from what we were selling to more just, you know, fabulous images, text, connecting with other people, leveraging off other accounts. Um, and, and leverage is a word that that's my word. I love the word leverage because it's all about lever leveraging your relationships, leveraging your time, leveraging everything around. You. That's what life is. It's about moving forward. And you can't do that if you don't leverage off these things, right? Right. So social tune has started going well. And uh, a very close friend of mine, Nancy Hadley out of California, she was the art director for TV shows like Kitchen Nightmares, Bar Rescue, all these shows. She would bring me on those shows and hire me. I'd fly around and do them. So she had contacted me around this time and I started picking up a couple little clients for the social media marketing company. And um, she was like, there's a new show coming out. It's called Tattoo Rescue. It's going to be on Spike. And they ended up hiring my social media team uh, company for doing their social media. So now I had my first sort of celebrity client. Mm -hmm. and, um, and from there, I just kept growing it with small and mid-cap clients. Got a connection in New York with a really incredible clothing line. Uh, well, they're more of a licensee. They represent clothing lines like um, English Laundry, Kenzie, Catherine Malandrino, you know, their company is Blue Star. So I got them as a client. And then I started flipping some of my celebrity clients. So at this time, you know, the mural and contracting business is booming. We just got hired to do um, a monster project. It's a 20,000 square foot house in Brighton. It was for a, a judge. And when we got there, we realized it was Judge Judy. So we ended up doing her place. Is she nice? Like, yeah, I thought she was really nice. I mean, she looked, she felt. She's all business. I mean, she is who she is. But if you do a good job, she's nice. If she only rips on you, don't do a good job. That's fine. <laughs> so, uh, I don't want to get so, ripped on by Judge Judy. No, thanks. No, it, it doesn't look like fun. I'll be honest with you. But she's a little tiny lady. She's super nice and friendly. She's very excited to see her house. And, you know, when I first met her, I was, you know, she just come to see, you know, the build out because it's being built. And I was like, you must love it here. And she's like, oh, my God, I love it so much. And at that moment. I think it was the day prior she signed her first $300 million syndication deal for Judge Judy. I think she signed another one since. What? That show is never done, but she does very well. Pays Interesting. I like to yeah. watch her rip on other people. <laughs> yeah. I do. So from that project, uh, I met a gentleman named Ed Manley who was working for a company called Armafo, and he's worked for Sherwin Williams and stuff like that. And he was like, listen, I got a project for you. A very big client of mine is moving back to New York from Chicago. And it was Rosie O'Donnell. So I ended up looking at her place and I basically duplicate these things that were done in our other house in her place. And uh, I think it was actually, it was Jersey. And uh, so I met her and I started doing a lot of work for her. I've done four of her places. And at one point, you know, she would do these little dolls. She'd have these little plastic money dolls and she would doodle on them. And she's got a great charity called Rosie's Kids. And I was like, Rosie, and she just loves art, does tons of art. And I was like, why aren't you selling this stuff? I mean, you walk into her studio and there's just a painting upon painting and these dolls just, just sitting there doing nothing. And I was like, why don't you sell them or raise money for your charity? And she's like, all right. So she set up a meeting with me and I came and I pitched her and she became a social tuna client. So we created a whole campaign and website and, and we sold the heck out. I think we sold $52,000 of these little dolls in the first year for Rosie's kids. Wow. So now we, we go back into leveraging. So leveraging that relationship. Um, Rosie's Theater, a uh, charity went on, you know, every year. And I was like, Rosie, why don't you have me do a live painting at the charity event and you can auction it off? I was like, I'll do two. So I went there. I did I had one that was already complete and I had one that I was working on. And uh, Cindy Lava was there. She was in it. And um, I forget the other gentleman's name, but it was representing Kinky Boots. So I finished it. She went on stage, auctioned off for 18 grand. And she pulled up the second one and that went for 18 grand. So it was a very cool experience. And uh, wow. that relationship. Really Wow! I just did a huge mural for a little while ago. So, um, so that that's incredible. So, yeah. So I would take these sort of high-end clients from my mural business, 
and I would convert them into social media. Then as time went on, my social media business grew and I would convert my high end celebrities and just wealthy clients from there into mural clients. Wow, so the, the, that's so smart. I love that you're the, leveraging. I'm leveraging. That's your word. Leveraging. Yes. Yep. Okay, so um, t tell us about that time when you, you were talking to me about this and you were going to give a mural, which it, it also is very interesting that you do a lot of murals in your studio in Connecticut and you ship them or deliver them. I do. To other, yeah, I didn't know about that kind of thing. I want you to talk about just a little bit about that um, right. because that right there is a way that you found a way to stay at home and do something that you love, but still provide this product that's huge. You know, like that's, that's, that's really hard to do. I wouldn't have even, was that just something that you came up with or something you already knew about? No, it was, it was mainly to do with my lower back. You know, I had lower back issues. Uh, I'm again, climbing the ladders and scaffold. So basically I have these huge walls in my studio. They're a monster. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do is I'll take gigantic rolls of canvas and I'll cover the wall with them. I'll measure out whatever space I'm doing. Right. So let's say it's, uh, let's say it's 20 feet high by 20 feet wide. Well, then I would do two strips of 10 feet canvas, 20 feet wide, paint each strip. And then they would get put together by a wallpaper installer. So I would do these murals yeah. in my studio and work, work on multiple projects at once, still run my other business. And then I would ship them to wherever I'm going, like Arkansas or California, wherever it is, fly out there, hire a wallpaper installer. They install it. Then I just do a couple of touch-ups and then I'm out the door. So now I don't have to worry about climbing and contorting. I can move the camps up and down the wall. I can do whatever I want. There. Yeah, that's, that's so smart. And it's really probably allowed you to scale more because you don't have to be so many places at one time. You can work on several things at a time. Exactly. Now what I'm doing here is different because it's an exterior mural. So it's on the building. So I obviously have to be here. Right. Uh, but my body strong. I feel good. No problems with the back, but it's because I give it time off. Yeah. And, and you get to push a button and it, and it raises you up. On my right. lift, yes. yes. My big boy's time. Yes, I love that thing. Boy. Love it. Okay. Tell me about the time you delivered one to um, Dennis Rodman and where you delivered it to and who else you met. And that that's pretty exciting. Yeah. I mean, that, look, you want to hear about the Tyson one. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so I, I've been working, doing some stuff for, for Dennis for a few years at that point. And, uh, we were doing his social media and I'd done a couple of murals. I did one large one, which is very cool. And, um, and then we designed some basketballs for him and, and uh, you know, I've done, I've done a basketball for Howard Stern where he went on the Howard Stern show. He's like, Pat, he's like, I need you to paint me a picture of uh, me and Howard on a basketball. And I was like, all right, when do you need to find? He's like tomorrow, basically. And I'm like, okay. So I got on. <laughs> so we went on the Howard Stern show and, and they said my name. They talked about the ball, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, this must have been maybe. That is cool. This is about six months ago, maybe. I, I was going out to LA for a, a trip on Monday for about 10 days. And I get a call from him on Friday and he's like, listen, he's like, I'm, I'm doing some business with Tyson. He's like, I want to, you know, I want to give him something as a thank you. Cause Dennis is a very nice guy. He's a very sweet guy when it comes to that. Um, and he was like, can you do a painting of, you know, Mike Tyson, his wife? And I was like, all right, now my news is Friday. I'm leaving on Monday. So I got two days to do this portrait with really, you know, nothing. So I went online. I really found a nice picture that I felt like I could do it in a quick manner. And um, and he wanted to be a similar size to one of the last paintings I did, I did of him. I did a great profile, of him, which is really dark and kind of cool looking. It's got all the tattoos. Mm -hmm. it's, you know. it's on the basketball, right? No, this is actually an actual painting I did of him. It was, a, it was a, maybe a six foot tall painting. It was very cool. Okay. Um, he was sort of sideways, no shirt on, tattoos, mm -hmm. a dark background. It's really kind of cool looking. Mm -hmm. So I, I basically found a great picture of Tyson and his wife. Got it drafted up, started painting it. Um, then I get a call from uh, a client and friend of mine, Darren Prince, who's a great guy. He represents Magic Johnson, Dennis Robin. He's the one that connected me with him. He's like, listen, Pat, I got a great client for you. He's like, you know, uh, Chevy Chase is in Rhode Island right now. He wants to, you know, meet you. Can you come up tomorrow? I can't say no to that. It's Chevy Chase. But I got two days to paint this painting. So no. Nope. All right, we're going we're gonna to do it. So I drive up to Rhode Island, he with Chevy Chase, I set up another date in the future so I can meet his wife. When I come back from L.A., that all goes well. Get back into town around 2 o'clock, and I just start painting. Get the painting done, fly out to L.A., I meet Dennis and his girlfriend, Misty, at um, Tyson's Ranch. 
which I think is in El Segundo. And uh, you walk in the place, and it's kind of like a little Dave and Buster's. It's got a very cool vibe to it. And so you walk in, it's got this huge open room, and then there's, there's little side offices that go right down the side. And, you know, so we walk in, and I hear, Dennis, get in here. And you can tell it's Tyson. Now, listen, <laughs> I love my Tyson. I'm a, I love boxing. I watched boxing as a little kid. I loved watching him. So I was pretty pumped to be, you know. Mm-hmm. So Dennis actually brought the other painting that did of him, the profile as well, in the painting of Tyson and his wife. So we walk in there and we walk in a little office and it's Tyson, his wife, and a couple other guys. And um, he's like, who are you? And I was like, I'm, I'm Patrick Anino. <laughs> and Dennis like, this is my guy. You know, check out this painting he did of me. He opens it up. Tyson starts going crazy. And then he opens up the painting of Mike and his wife. I was like, oh, my God, that's crazy. You've got to be in my podcast. He's like, come here, I want to talk to you. So I go sit down next to him. And he's just like the coolest, nicest guy as well. His wife is gorgeous, and she's super nice, and just like a really good vibe there, you know? Um, now, mind you, there's a, a smoke in the room. He's got a little joint behind his ear. A cloud of smoke. <laughs> Everybody's going to be good. And um, so he's like, listen, he's like, he's like, I want to, he goes, I want you to do a painting of me. He's like, I had this idea that I, I wanted for a really long time. He's like, I want you to paint me with like horns coming out of my head. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, I got horns out of my head. And I was like, all right, I could do that. So then uh, we're talking, everything goes on. And I go to his wife later and I go, does he really want horns? And she's like, yeah. She shows me this picture and it's like a little Greek corn coin, like a little Greek coin with like Caesar with the little horns, the Greek horns. So I was like, all right. I was like, listen, Mike, if you want me to do this, let me take a picture of you, of your face and how you want it. And I'll, I'll make it all work together. So he made this kind of crazy, like mean face with his mouth so mouth open, and uh, you know, went back to Connecticut. And this piece was big. He wanted it, it was ten feet tall by ten feet wide. It's a monster piece. So yeah, I came back. I did it. Got paid. Flew back to LA. And you know, at this time, I got to figure out what to do with this because I don't want to bring a rolled up canvas. I want to bring a nice framed big canvas, big and bold. So it's really impressive. Mm-hmm. So I called my old friend Nancy Hadley from all the TV shows. She lives out there. So I shipped it to her. She stretched it, we fumbled it into a truck, and then we delivered it with a sheet over it and unveiled it. And it was a great experience. It was really, really cool. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So tell them why, why the horns. Tell them what that means. Go. Greatest of all time. Yes. <laughs> That's so yeah. neat. I love yeah, that story. Yeah. And I also love how you just like, yeah, so I go out and I meet Chevy. So my, my year revolves around Christmas because... The family all, you know, gets on the couch and we watch National Lampoon's, you know, uh, vacation and we watch the Christmas and we, we dress up like Cousin Eddie and we just, we do all the things. That's like what you do if you, you have to do that. So the fact that you have like, you know, touched him is a big damn deal to me. I love that. I love, he's a great I love guy. that so much. He's a great guy and his family is, uh, they are the sweetest people in the world. He's got three daughters and an unbelievable wife, and they are just like the nicest family in the world. And, and you know, blessings to them because they, they give me an opportunity to do some neat things with them, and I design their stickers and their shirts and run their social media, and um, and they give me the leeway to do that. I mean, they're just they're really just great people. I mean, some of my favorite people right there as far as clients go. Yeah. Um Yes, I'm, I've really liked all the stories you've been able to tell me that you, you know, maybe not all the stories you can say on this uh, interview, but really awesome stories. Um, so tell me uh, what advice you would give all these little small business owners like myself that are, you know, watching this. Um, what's something, what's the advice you would give them? Because a lot of them are struggling and uh, I, I feel like a lot of people have paralysis by analysis. Um, and you've, you've obviously, you, you started really taking off when you put aside the cubicle and what you thought you were supposed to do in the security. Yeah. And, you know, and follow your own passion. That's when everything really started taking off for you when you, when you accepted who you are and the talents that you were given and you just kept evolving from there. I mean, look, to me, it's an honor to be an entrepreneur. It's the hardest job in the world, but it's the best job in the world. If you want to be an entrepreneur, listen, it's, it's a gift to have the opportunity to create something out of nothing and work for yourself. So if you're going to do that, you got to do it. 
And a lot of people, they'll try business and then they'll stop. They'll be like, oh, it didn't work out. But did you really try it? I mean, when I first started, and I still do, I mean, you see me working. I work every day. I work every mm-hmm. single day. I'm making calls yeah. in the morning. I'm working on the bureau at night. I mean, so you got to do things. So any entrepreneur, if you want to be successful, just do things. Just do stuff. Meet people. Go out and meet people and do as many things as you can. I, um, you know, one of the things when an artist asked me, you know, how to get clients, I'm like, put yourself in situations where wealthy individuals are around. So, you know, if you want to donate murals to a school, that's fine. That's nice things to do. I, I do it all the time. That's, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a gift to them. But if you want to get new business, where are the wealthy people? Where's your client base? Where are they hanging out? Go hang out with them. So that's why I like doing the high-end charity events where I paint live because now I'm seen. I'm not lost in the mix. I'm doing something different in the area. Everybody around me has money to spend on a mural. Social media, same thing. Talk to people. You don't tell people what you do. How are they going to know? Some people are like, well, I don't want to brag. It's not bragging. How is somebody going to know that I paint murals if I don't tell them? How are they going to know I do social media if I don't tell them? So talk to people. Get to know them. And guess what? When you're talking to them, don't just talk to them. Listen to them as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I remember early on, I would be on the phone with a client, and they'd talk for like 30 minutes, and I wouldn't say much. And they'd be like, that's the best conversation I ever had. And they'd be like, we didn't even really have a conversation. But it's okay. <laughs> just so you know? know, that was not a conversation. <laughs> But it's important, you know, so it's about just doing over and over. Again. Do not stop. If you want it, you go get it. It's like working out. If you want to work out and get in shape, go work out. You know, there's so many reasons why we can sit on the couch and watch TV. But guess what? It takes one second, one choice to get up and go to the gym or go walking or run or whatever you want to do. So if you want something in life, you can't complain about not having it if you're not putting 100% into doing it. You know what I mean? Right. And, and lying to yourself. I know that for a long time, um, I answered questions with when they would say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm so busy. And, and honestly, you, you know, know, we call, I, that, we call that busy, we call that busy being busy, busy being busy. Yeah. That's when you're just doing busy work and you don't have time for something else. Are you really doing anything? You're moving you forward or are you just doing stuff to do it? Yeah. Yeah. Farting you know? around. We call that farting around. That's farting I around. Like that. <laughs> Fumble farting around. Yeah. I so, like and, and when you're more strategic and you like you do, um, I know we only have like three minutes, but your way of organizing your freaking email. Okay. You guys. So he goes like this and he gets his emails and he moves them to folders. Then his people that work for him know to look at those folders. He doesn't even have to yell at him or talk to him or text him and say, Hey, go check the folder. I mean, maybe he does, but he, he, he's got a system and a process that you've put into place that makes you efficient. So you're not busy being busy. You are doing the 2000 foot idea guy things and they're doing the minutia. I had to do that though, Brooklyn. I'm not an organized person. I'm an artist. I'm ADD. I'm all over the place. I had to create a system that made me seem organized, made me become organized. So, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Every morning I wake up, I go to my studio, I take a piece of paper. I make my short-term list of what I'm doing for the day and my long-term list. Cross them off as they go. And the next day, I do it over and over again because that's the only way to keep myself on point because I get lost during the day. So then I can go back to that list and be like, oh, I'm supposed to do this and this, right? Got distracted. I'm like, squirrel. You know, cornhole. Yeah, cornhole. Yeah, right. My weakness. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, so you're going to be my guest every week on Thursday. Awesome. Um, okay. So what advice would you give yourself starting out that, you know, now, what would you tell yourself back when you were 18 in Florida, fumble farting around? I'll be honest with you. Uh, and there, and I wish we could talk about some of the mistakes i made in business because those were the best lessons ever. And they were the best things that ever happened to me. I don't think I changed any part of any time in my life. Every part, good and bad, all propelled me forward every single thing. So I, I okay. wish I could say that. Yeah. So, okay. But I mean, that little hiatus of, of going to the cubicle gave you back to needed to know that you're never going to re- break through that ceiling. It's never going to fulfill you um, financially or in your heart with the things that you're passionate about. Right. But you had to do I, that I to get that, perspective. I needed, I needed it. I needed to say, yeah. hey. I don't ever want to do this again. This is not, you know what I mean? It was, it was like it killed my soul going yeah. to that cubicle. I was just, you know, and I'm a happy guy, but it was just not a good scene. 
Yes. So. Yes. So the best way to move forward is to burn the bridge behind you. And I mean, that doesn't mean like, you know, just go out in a blaze of glory, but that just means quit that, move on. And that's not an option. Just keep moving forward. But if you're going to do it, you got to do it. Do it. Not just half-ass it. Mm -hmm. You got to do it all the way every day. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate for that you came and gave us your time. And um, sure. I can't wait to see you paint Marilyn today. He's going to paint yeah. Marilyn's face on the, the mural. He's saving her for last because she's the best. Um, but anyways, I appreciate you. And I hope that everybody else joins me next Thursday for episode three. I'm doing Thanks it. Okay. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs>